Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to say thank you. Very generous introduction. Um, and this is the book right here. Savage Feast is the name. Um, Three Generations, Two Continents, and a Dinner Table. What I thought I would do is just um, tell you a bit about how this book came into being, and maybe then we could move on to the Q&A. Um, so as Carolyn mentioned, it's a family history told through recipes. Um, why did I want to tell a family story through food beyond the obvious reasons? But I think, you know, people ask you, when did you start thinking about writing this book? And um, in some ways, the right answer is since I was five years old, though I hardly knew that this was happening then. Um, already at that age, um, something that happened not only every day, but three times a day in our house felt very strange to me. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, in the Soviet Union, it took quite a bit of time to find food. Um, it was there, but you had to go to lots of places, stand in lots of lines, know lots of people. Um, so a lot of time was spent sort of gathering the ingredients. And then my grandmother certainly spent hours, hours uh, cooking it. But then when it came time to eat, the five of us, it was, um, me, my parents, and my maternal grandparents, we lived together, as many of the generations did in the Soviet Union. We just swooped down on that food like vultures. It was gone in minutes. Um, and it always felt very strange to me. I wasn't quite sure where it came from. Um, it isn't as if I had a contrast to compare it to, but it just it was noteworthy. And the other thing that was noteworthy to me was the way that my grandmother was just, and this also won't surprise you, I'm sure many of you have elders who behave this way, she was just really obsessed with everybody finishing everything on their plates, right? The two things that had to have, that always happened during a meal is this, this merry-go-round started where everybody wanted everyone else at the table to try something from their plate. You don't have enough fish, you don't have enough bread, you don't have enough rice, right? And you're just constantly moving it around from your plate to the plate of others, this obsession with feeding. And also my grandmother got really, really upset uh, when people at the table didn't finish what they had in front of them. And like, by this point in American life, it's kind of like a cliche, right? The Jewish grandmother who won't let you stop eating. But it wasn't quite so funny when it was happening in our Minsk kitchen in 1985 or whatever. Um, and I sometimes couldn't finish uh, what she wanted me to finish because she certainly piled too much on the plate. Um, and so I'd resort to all kinds of tricks to to get around it without hurting her feelings because only 16 people in this um that that sort of wasn't uh acceptable um so for example when i got too much oatmeal i'd wait till she stepped out of the kitchen and i tiptoed to the window and there was this nice little bush directly underneath our second story window and like i would just scoop all the oatmeal the oatmeal onto the window and by the time she came back in the kitchen my plate was empty um, we had these funny Soviet footstools that had a top compartment that opened up. Um, and so I'd scoop some of my eggs in there. Uh, so the plate was empty when she came back to the kitchen. Um, nobody ever said a word. I guess I benefited from the fact that we, we lived, and this will come up again later in the talk, but we lived in a culture where people didn't talk about things, right? Uncomfortable things weren't discussed. So I never had an opportunity. It just, it didn't even occur to me that I could ask my grandmother why she behaved this way. And she certainly never brought it up that she found old eggs inside our um, taburetki, our footstools. Um, <clears throat> and it wasn't for another 10 or 15 years that I began to receive an answer to the questions um, that came into my mind then. And this was already after we immigrated. If you, when you lived behind, if you lived behind the Iron Curtain, you were not eligible to receive um, restitution uh, from the German government um, for having been a Holocaust survivor, which my grandmother was. Um, and so when it finally became possible to do so, because we were now in America, the task of taking down her story for the application was entrusted to me because I was the one with the best English in the family. And I'm sure like many people you know, my grandmother had less than zero interest in saying anything about what happened to her during the war. Uh, but now she had to, if she wanted to receive restitution funds um, she, she had to have it put down. And it was in that process uh, that I learned things that helped me start to piece together these answers that I'm referring to. Um, as you may know, Minsk uh, was the westernmost major Soviet city 
1941 uh, when the Germans invaded. And so it was the first place uh, they came into. My grandmother could see uh, German paratroopers all in black coming down from the sky June 22nd, 1941 in Minsk. Uh, my grandfather's family, they had horses. And so they filled the cart and they hitched the horses and they managed to get out of town before my grandmother did, my grandmother's family. Um, but my grandmother's family, like so many others, uh, were herded into what soon became the Minsk ghetto. Uh, it was formed in July 1941 and 100,000 people living in, in, inside of it. Um, my grandmother's grandmother refused. She'd been a, around for World War I and she was not going to have herself a repeat of that experience. And she actually squeezed herself stuffed herself behind the furnace, this enormous furnace that they had inside the house, which they used to heat the house um, and to cook their food. And she basically suffocated herself behind it. Um, and so um, already um, there was this kind of tragedy in the family before the war had really even begun. Um, once inside the ghetto, you know, it, it wasn't like a concentration camp, like people were marched out uh, regularly for work details. And um, very soon after um, the ghetto was formed, my grandmother's sister managed to slip out um, and join, I'm sure you've heard of the partisans. These are anti, um, these are, these are uh, guerrillas, um, anti-Nazi uh, guerrilla units who are operating in the forests outside Minsk. These are very dense, thick forests. They're so dense and thick that like there's an act, there's a separate word um, in Russian for the kind of forest this is, there's forest and then there's pusha, which is this particularly um, impenetrable kind of woods where even the Germans didn't really tread. And she really wanted to get the rest of her family out, but it was complicated because many of these guerrilla units, they weren't particularly fond of Jews. They were anti-Nazi, but they weren't pro-Jewish. And so to arrange an escape from the ghetto with the necessary sort of people watching and procuring and the right drivers and the right shepherds, it was, it was always very complicated. And it wasn't for another two, more than two years, September 1943, um, that my grandmother, who was still there with her parents and her grandfather, um, when sort of all the necessary pieces fell together for her to join her sister. Um, and unfortunately, her grandfather became very ill um, shortly before they were all supposed to slip off and um, her parents wouldn't leave him behind. Um, and so my grandmother very reluctantly had to go alone. And she, she you know, one of her parents said, don't, don't you dare come back to get us just, there's only one direction for you, which is away from here. Uh, the other parent, her father um, was of a different mind. He said, we're young yet, we, uh, we can be useful, we can, we can work. Um, uh, and he asked her to come back for them if she could. Um, and it all became moot the next month because if some of you know the history in October, 1943, um, the fourth and final pogrom uh, took place in the Minsk ghetto and everyone who had managed to survive the previous three were murdered, including my, the entirety of my grandmother's family. Um, she did make it out the month before. She did manage to uh, join um, this uh, partisan, unit of partisans. Um, and it's what happened over the next 10 months before Minsk was liberated in, in, in the summer of 1944 uh, that's most relevant to the story I'm telling you, which is that she had to survive um, on berries, uh, on potato peels, uh, sucking on tree bark. And 10 months of that was enough to make her absolutely crazy on the subject of food. Um, you know, after the war, when they, when, when, when all of them came back to Minsk, um, she came in sight. I don't know. I don't know what the setting was. I just remember the story um, of a tiny loaf of bread, which is the first loaf of bread I think she, she, she might have seen since uh, uh, 19, 1943, if not 1941. Um, and, you know, it was a tiny loaf because flour was scarce, but someone managed to make it. She, you know, my grandmother was an incredibly um, decorous woman who would never dare to do something unseemly. And just like an animal, she leaped on that, leapt, she leapt on that loaf of bread and devoured all of it. 
um, in one sitting as people watched. And then she proceeded to vomit all of it out because her insides couldn't handle that um, after 10 months of, um, of such starvation. Um, <clears throat> and, and after the war, the only job she would accept was at a bread factory. She wanted to be near bread all the time. It was this kind of mania that kind of stood for everything that she'd been through and everything she now needed, right? Like um, <clears throat> she and her sister came out of the war as orphans. They tried to return to the home where they lived before the war, but it had been overtaken by a Belarusian collaborator who'd worked for the Germans. Um, and he sort of begrudgingly uh, surrendered to them a little corner of his home that used to be theirs. And can you imagine sharing your, 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 the home that you used to share with a family that's been murdered with somebody who collaborated with the people who murdered it, who, who, who murdered that family. Perhaps he'd done it himself. Um, you know, they, they got some, she and her sister, they got some clothes from the Red Cross. Um, and when they were out one day, um, this guy stole over to their part of the home and, and stole all the clothes and pawned it on the, uh, on the black market. Um, so, you know, people like that, girls who are 15 and, and 16, not really in a position to make demands from the situation around them, but my grandmother would not say yes to, to anything except the job at the bread factory. And I remember when I was a kid, there were always four or five loaves of bread in the house. There always had to be, right? One or two were never enough. And as soon as they started going bad, they were pitched into the trash. Um, which may not seem so surprising in American life, but in the Soviet Union, it was unheard of. Nothing was wasted. You couldn't afford to waste anything. And you've never met somebody so resourceful as a Soviet housewife. And so if, if God forbid, bread began to go stale, um, it was reused. It was reused for breadcrumbs. It was reused for stuffing, but it was never thrown out. Um, and it was only after my grandmother passed that I sort of developed the sophistication to understand that like people respond to trauma in many different ways, but in the case of my family, in these two very disparate ways. Um, my grandmother's sister was a very reserved, um, almost dour um, uh, a woman who was incredibly frugal and was always very wary. Uh, whereas my grandmother was just an extremely extravagant person. She had this incredible bouffant that rose like half a foot off of her head. She slept in a pink uh, hairnet. She had this gold tooth. She loved to dance. She loved to spend money. She loved to eat. Um, and I just realized that like some people respond to this unimaginable kind of trauma by living as if some new installment of that trauma is going to show up again tomorrow. And so you're hoarding and reserving and saving and preparing. And that was my grandmother's sister. Um, and then other people, in order to survive, in order to stay sane, um, they have to live um, as if it's never going to happen again, right? That's the fantasy. Um, and that sort of explains for me my grandmother's extravagance. Um, <clears throat> and so it won't surprise you to hear that, that she owned the kitchen. Nobody else was allowed in it. Um, in marrying my grandfather, she married a man who was incredibly adept at navigating the Soviet black market to get all sorts of food products that were usually available only to, you know, political VIPs. Uh, he was only, uh, only a barber, um, but he used that position to make all kinds of acquaintances um, and strike all kinds of deals. Um, <clears throat> um, in English, it's under the table. In Russian, it's to the left. Right, so all his entire life revolved around deals to the left, right? Like in the Soviet Union, um, jobs were assigned centrally. If you were a barber, you applied for a job to like some central barbering agency and they told you which barbershop to go to and that was gonna be your place of employment. Well, my grandfather bribed the necessary people in order to end up at the barbershop that was attached to the, tr to the train terminal. Um, and the reason that he did that is because this is the late 1940s, early 1950s. There's not a lot of uh, flying going on and all the commerce that's coming into Minsk is coming into Minsk on overnight trains. And all the people who are bringing it in, well, before they, their appointments of the day, they need to stop in for a haircut or a shave, a little freshening up before they go into town. And after my grandfather has finished doing for them whatever they need doing, instead of taking their 
um, piddling 30 cents or whatever the official price for a haircut was, he said, hey, um, let's forget about the money. What are you, uh, what are you packing? Um, and maybe the first person of the day was packing Armenian cognac. And then um, as townspeople began to replace the, the, the night train people in his chair, he would begin to barter what he got from the previous person in exchange for whatever the new person had to offer. And so like, you know, a crate of cognac became a set of silver spoons, became a vacation voucher, became the phone number of a pediatrician who was willing to come to your house first for his, foot, for his house call, et cetera, et cetera. And so my grandfather could get what needed to be got. And just like, just like um, a bird dog with prey in its mouth, he would come home every day with some new uh, haul of goodies that my grandmother used to make magic um, in the kitchen. And for me, one of the most interesting things about how they use this food, food, you know, I think you're gathering was a kind of currency that was sometimes more valuable than money um, in this place where officially janitors and surgeons earned the same meaningless thing, which was $100 a month. Um, and so when my grandparents needed something that they had difficulty acquiring, um, either because they lived in a country where there wasn't enough of it to go around, or because they were Jews and they were discriminated against, they used food in order to uh, right the balance. Um, one of the most striking examples that I learned was, you know, my mother was an excellent student and she um, ended up valedictorian of her high school. But it was unseemly for a Jew to be first. Being such a minority, how did a Jew, you know, it makes the non-Jews look bad. And so my mother was uh, demoted uh, to second place. And the person who was in second place was elevated to first. And what did my grandparents do? My grandfather found his way to the principal of the high school and he approached him and he, and, and he asked for an appointment. He walked into the office and he said, you know, you have provided our daughter with such, such a valuable education. I, we just wanted to thank you. And we were wondering if you would come by the house for a toast and, 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 and just a little bit of dinner. And everybody knew what the game was. Everybody knew what this was, co what this was code for, right? And the principal said yes, ostensibly to be thanked for, you know, his amazing educational service to the family, but he showed up and he ate like a king and he drank like a king and the exchange did not have to be discussed. Uh, and again, at this table in my grandparents' house, he found things that were very difficult to come by, uh, even on the table of a high school principal. Um, and then he went back to the school and guess what? My mom came back to first place. Um, <clears throat> and this is a kind of innocuous example um, but there were many occasions when my grandfather resorted to crime, pure crime, um, but it was never in the service of violence, gratuitous violence or cruelty. It was always, not always, um, I don't wanna uh, pretty it up, but it was very often in the service of writing um, this kind of imbalance caused by nothing other than the hypocrisy and immorality and bigotry of, of the system. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, my, my, my grandmother was just synonymous. She was just synonymous with our kitchen. And perhaps it's now more understandable why none of us felt authorized <laughs> to question how she ruled it. Um, eventually it became time for us to immigrate. Uh, we had tried to leave the Soviet Union in 1980, right after I was born. Um, but it didn't work out and we were stuck for another eight years. But finally in 1988, after Gorbachev showed up and the door sort of swung open once more, we, um, we managed to receive permission. And um, it was such an unbelievably chaotic, terrifying, dramatic, traumatic time, because you have to imagine like in the Soviet Union, people didn't even get to leave to Bulgaria for vacation. Um, any person who left uh, the borders was a, was a suspect person, a person suspect of defection, of acquiring foreign ideas, even if you were inside the communist bloc. And so, in, you know, there was, an, there was an information blockade. We knew all the worst things about America without knowing any of the best things. And we had all these uh, positive and also incorrect fantasies that festered in the absence of accurate, nuanced information. 
And so to have finally received permission to go, to be asked to um, pack your life, a century of life in that place into five suitcases, which is all we were allowed, one suitcase per person. Um, it was just, it was just consuming in, in, in a way that nobody had ever experienced. And so it wasn't until, you know, you couldn't just fly to America because the Soviet Union would never allow um, its Jews to go directly to America uh, because it would have just been very embarrassing on the international stage, um, right? Supposedly things were perfect in a socialist paradise and nobody could officially be unhappy enough to wish to go, go and go to the imperialist enemy of all places. And so these like um, diplomatic processing points sprung up for one reason or another um, the first one was in Vienna, because I think Vienna was, remained uh, a kind of neutral place. Um, I don't think Vienna, Austria actually joined the EU until as late as 1995. And so it was seen in this kind of neutral ground. And it wasn't until we, we got to Vienna, um, and it was only, it was only, it was a 36 hour train, train ride, but it was, it was honestly like going from North Korea to Oz. Um, you know, it, just, it was inconceivable to us that only a day's train ride away, people lived like this. And by like this, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything you haven't heard of, but like these people had fruit year round. You could buy bananas whenever you wanted. Um, you could walk into a supermarket and what a strange place that was. It had automatic sliding doors. We'd never encountered automatic sliding doors in our lives. The first time that um, my father, uh, everybody was too afraid to go out. And so he was sent out um, and the first place, he didn't, go to, he didn't go to a museum. He didn't go to a cathedral. He didn't go to an opera house. He went to a supermarket. That was our first destination. And he just reached for the door handle and the doors opened in front of him and he literally fell in and he nearly toppled this Austrian grandmother to death because um, he'd never seen such a thing before. Um, and it was just, it was surreal does not begin to describe it. Um, but what all of us in this chaos forgot to realize is that we had just taken ourselves or had been taken to a country where they spoke in the language of the people who had murdered my grandmother's family. Um, and I wish I could convey to you what her face was like when she heard that language um, for the first time in 43 years. Um, she did not leave the little hotel where they put us up um, for um, once in the next three weeks. You know, the, the people sponsoring our passage um, there was all sorts, all sorts of required stuff. You had to get a medical checkup because America did not want to take in any sick people. And you had to get a kind of ideological checkup. You had to go to a synagogue in order to see what that was like. And with, with, with this authority that none of us knew we were allowed to possess, she refused to do any of that. The only thing that she did for three weeks straight, three and sometimes four and sometimes five times a day is she cooked. She cooked like a fiend. It was the way that she dealt with the chaos inside her. It wasn't just Austria. It was also the fact that for the first time in over 40 years, she'd been separated from her sister. And even though um, they were two completely different people, you could not imagine people who were more spliced together. How many times would I peek into that kitchen where nobody was allowed to step and I'd see the two of them just sort of bent toward each other like trees, just whispering about something um, um, and always um, <clears throat> one of my grandmother's favorite things, she loved to make jam, right? And even though you could get fruit during a very short period of time in the Soviet Union during the appropriate season, it was some of the best fruit you could possibly have. We did not really have industrial agriculture. We did not really have pesticides. We didn't have the refrigeration for long, you know, distant transport. So as funny as it sounds, the Soviet Union was local and seasonal and organic like many decades before America <clears throat> remembered what that was like. And so these strawberries, right, they were like one third the size of American strawberries, but they had three times the flavor. And she would just, she would constantly be making jam. And when the jam sent up, um, it's called the shum in Russian, the froth. She loved scooping off that froth and um, slicing off a huge hunk of this beautiful um, kind of meringue-like, only the shape was like meringue, the taste was very different, 
white bread called palinitsa. And she, you know, the, 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 the layer of butter that went on top of that slice of bread was as, as thick as my finger. And then this shum on top of that with, uh, with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, that was just, she could eat that six times a day, right? Her sister, nothing more than a cup of tea. I, I, I think there were weeks um, that went by without that woman eating at all, but my grandmother ate enough for two. Um, they were just always, always whispering toward each other. And now my grandmother had to do without her. Um, and so I just think it was, it was, a, it was a shock for her, um, even greater than, than for any of us. And like so much else in life, she, uh, I don't know if I can say she solved it, but she tried to solve it through food. Um, now, when we got to America, um, <clears throat> um, uh, fairly quickly, within several years, we got some really bad news. Um, and American medicine uncovered this very quickly, far more quickly than Soviet medicine ever did. I mean, Soviet medicine did not. Um, in the 1970s, my grandmother had had a gallbladder, had had her gallbladder removed. And during the operation, she had needed uh, a blood transfusion. And as we learned in the United States, the blood that she got was infected. Um, and she developed uh, cirrhosis of the liver and she was never much of a drinker. Um, so it's particularly uh, embittering. Um, <clears throat> it's even more embittering that sort of like, just because you remove yourself to the United States does not mean you've saved yourself from the long hand um, of the Soviet experience. And um, if any of you know, it's, it's a terrible, terrible uh, wasting disease. Um, and after six years of some pretty bad suffering, she, she died. Um, and, you know, I thought of it as our first American death. I, I, it was even, you know, it was honestly our first death since the war. Nobody within the inner circle of the family had passed away um, since that time. And I think it was a shock to all of us. And this is not the biggest way in which it was a shock, but it's the most relevant one to the story. Um, suddenly the kitchen was empty. Um, and, you know, not that my mother hadn't known how to cook, but you know, she'd long forgotten by this point. My grandfather couldn't even boil a pot of water. Um, and by this point, we had done what America basically imposes, not imposes, but invites families to do, which is to move away from each other. We were no longer living together. I was in Manhattan. My grandfather was in Brooklyn. My parents were in New Jersey. And, you know, we weren't going to move back in with him. Our lives did not permit that. But all of a sudden, you know, because my grandmother, I don't have to tell you, she cooked until her, until the last day she was vertical. Um, <clears throat> and, um, at this point, uh, you know, my grandmother had, because she was, she was terminally ill, she had 24 hour care from the city of New York. And, um, my grandfather asked my mom to get him the same. And he could say something so naive because even, even 26 years after, uh, arriving in America, his understanding of how things worked in America was so basic and so elementary, willfully so, um, that he thought he could just uh, bribe his way, just like in the Soviet Union, um, into the same for himself. And my mom tried to explain that this was available only to people who were terminally ill. And so my grandfather said this thing that was you know, his favorite refrain, which was, don't worry about it, just set up the appointment. So my mother made this claim to the city that he was also unwell, that sort of he needed care as well. And the city agreed to send an assessor to determine the level of care, complete waste of time. Um, my mom had to be there because um, uh, my grandfather, like I say, didn't speak a word of English. He, he continued to live in a kind of Soviet Union of the mind, Russian television, Russian newspapers, Russian groceries. Um, and the doorbell rings, my mom goes to get it. Um, by the time she returns to the living room, uh, this, you know, bowed by grief, but otherwise relatively hale uh, gentleman who was her father until a moment ago is suddenly sitting there um, like, uh, <clears throat> like a paraplegic. Um, and he is muttering under his breath 
and he is shaking in place and he's gnashing his teeth and he's got saliva dribbling out of his mouth and he should have gone into acting. He should have gone into theater. He should have gone into Hollywood instead of how little he chose to do instead. Um, he kept up the show and thereby earned himself 24 hour care from the city of New York. And it's the kind of story that makes you groan because, you know, um, he managed through subterfuge to get something that really wasn't rightfully his. And if something like that was almost heroic in the Soviet Union, it was quite the opposite um, in America, which was far more generous to us than the Soviet Union had been. But the stories are never so simple because even though this was indisputably a sin, this sort of original sin did bring into his life an incredible woman who is sort of the other part um, of Savage Feast and um, just tell you a bit about her before opening it up to questions. Um, her name was Oksana, um, is Oksana, she's still around. She was from Western Ukraine. And she, um, even in 2004, um, 13 years after the end of the Soviet Union, the sort of the, the, the semi-rural part of Western Ukraine where she lives, um, continued to live in very Soviet ways, um, economically, a lot of corruption, not uh, kind of broken economy. And she eventually decided to leave it all behind and try to make some money in the US. Um, and my grandfather was the first person that she was assigned to. Um, and so you had this man who had just lost a woman who had, you know, whose side he had lived by for 55 years. And you had this woman who had just lost her family and her country in order to try to make a living, a dignified living in the US. Um, and they, they literally could not have ended up with another category of person because Exana did not speak English and neither did my grandfather. Um, but it wasn't only that, it was the fact that my grandfather continued to live in this like pickled Soviet Union uh, of the mine 26 years later. And Oksana too, despite technically arriving from a kind of liberated free Ukraine, it was, it was the same country it had been under Soviet rule. And I think they found just this incredible kinship and companionship in each other. Um, it was never romantic, it was nothing like that, but it didn't have to be. Um, you know, my grandfather loved me and he loved my parents, but there was a limit to what we could share because we had moved forward with our American lives. We respected him, we honored him, but at the end of the day, the things that we could agree on were relatively minor. And whereas my parents were willing to pretend they agreed, I was not. I sort of, I sort of took my American freedoms for all they were worth. Um, I was not going to agree unless, uh, uh, unless I felt it. Um, and so in Oksana, he just found a kindred spirit, but it also went beyond the national cultural thing. Um, as I learned over time, and it was quite a bit of time before I came into this kind of familiarity and intimacy with Oksana where she would reveal this to me, but something that I gathered was one of Oksana's, uh, as she saw it, curses in life was that she um, was never, this, these are her words, because uh, they will sound very non-feminist to you. Um, she could never in life um, find a man who was as resolute and as strong and as much of a leader as she wished him to be. All Oksana ever wanted from a, from a partner was that kind of man. And it was her curse to always be more creative, more efficient, more productive, more imaginative, harder working, more ambitious than any of the men that she could find in Ukraine. And whereas um, and in, in my grandfather, she found a man who knew how to part with money, who, you know, you know they, they, they went, it won't surprise you to learn, they went grocery shopping every day, even when that fridge was full, because just even 26 years later, he couldn't buy enough. Um, and there was no trip to the grocery store that did not involve him stealing off to the flower aisle and coming back for her with a single rose. And um, again, it, it, was, it was completely uh, non-romantic and it didn't have to be romantic. That kind of chivalry, that kind of resoluteness, that kind of resourcefulness, that kind of forethought, that kind of care um, that she always felt from him, right? He was, he was always asking after her family. He was always trying to buy her a croissant at the bakery. He was always trying, right? Um, I think it meant a lot to her. Um, 
in addition to the fact that these were two people who knew how to live the Soviet way, which is to say that their various schemes to the left hardly ended because they had left their respective countries. I think they became a kind of bank in, their, in the apartment building where my grandfather lived, where they loaned out money to various people at interest and they whole, had a whole concern going. There was some kind of scheme with a pharmacy. There was a scheme with the Turkish dry goods guide on 86th street. It was, you know, um, if you weren't being per personally harmed by what they got up to, it was kind of a remarkable thing to observe. Um, but where Oksana's sort of um, presence concerns this story most concretely is, as I've just hinted, by this point in our American lives, I was really drifting pretty hard away from my family and from my home culture. I was desperate to become an American. I was embarrassed about the things, the qualities, the people, the culture, the institutions that had produced me. And I, I couldn't excavate it out of myself. I couldn't dialyze it out of myself. And the next best thing was just to remove myself physically. Um, and so I really wasn't coming around anymore, not to New Jersey, not to Brooklyn. And my grandfather couldn't understand it. He was so hurt by it. Um, and I tried to explain um, and the, the reason both for that and for the, the cultural drift w was that, you know, you know, immigration is, off, is, often, is often spoken about um, as, as sort of an exclusively positive experience, the American dream, all this and that, you know, flight, flight from oppression. Um, but one thing that's mentioned less often than I think it should be is, is the, the cost it claims from the relationship between the generations, um, right? Because the, the elders stay largely the way they were, unless there is something inside them that prompts them to Americanize, to at least learn something about the country around them. Because America says, freedom, you are free to remain as you were, right? My grandmother, my, my grandfather, who didn't know a single thing about America was no less American, according to this concept than any of you here right now. Um, it's not necessarily a concept that I agree with, but that's, that's, that's what it is. Um, but I had been brought here to take advantage of all the wonderful freedoms and opportunities that America made available to somebody like me um, without my religion, my faith being a cost. Um, but I was expected to simultaneously take advantage of all these opportunities, which required risk, which required initiative, which required delving into the unknown, which required spending money before earning money, which required trusting people, which required building relationships, all these things on which America functions and yet somehow remain the very good and obedient Soviet boy that I'd been and was expected to remain. And what, what does it mean to remain Soviet? It means that you're skeptical of everything and everyone. You're cynical toward the possibility of success. You take no risks whatsoever. You never leave your family geographically. Um, you believe in force as the ideal solution to every problem. Money first, expenditure later, no, you know, no investment before income, et cetera, et cetera. And initially I was too young to understand um, the discrepancy between these two objectives that were set before me, which I wanted to fulfill because I wanted to be a good son. But like in order to be a good son, I had to be two things that were completely irreconcilable. And there were many others too. Um, and being unable to articulate why this was impossible, eventually I um, just picked the next best thing, which was again, a way. Um, and it was right around this time that Oksana showed up in my family's life. Um, and it's really simple. She was the most amazing cook I've ever encountered. Um, fully, 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 fully on my grandmother's level. But it was very different cooking because, um, you know, Belarus is up north. We have rye. Ukraine, particularly southwestern Ukraine, um, it's much warmer. It's basically the same, um, what is that? Latitude, longitude? Latitude as Provence. They have eggplant, they have melons, they have pumpkins, they have wheat instead of rye, completely different recipes. Um, and, you know, Oksana would put these things on the table that were so amazing that all of a sudden, all these people who kind of didn't want to have anything to do with each other would find their way there but even more importantly, like for the 15 or the 20 or even miraculously sometimes the 30 minutes that it took us to eat, um, we were too busy enjoying it to fight. 
And it's a reprieve that we hadn't had for many years, more or less since my grandmother died, right? Her death kind of released us all to stop, you know, from our best behaviors. Um, it was the biggest of gifts. And we became extremely grateful to Oksana for it. She, she perhaps not even intending to, but using this thing that can stand for so much, you know, healed our family to, you know, to a certain degree, or at least gave us the opportunity to start to make our way back to each other. Um, and it wasn't a straight line, but it was certainly better than the opposite. Um, and so eventually I just became so interested in her food. I became so interested in her that I asked her if I could um, learn some of her recipes at her side. I ended up following her to Ukraine uh, to do the same there. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the recipes in the Q&A, but they're, they're just, they're so trippy. Um, one of her specialties was chicken liver pie. Um, which sounds ridiculous, but you basically pass chicken livers uh, together with onions through a grinder and otherwise make the ingredients of, of, a, of a, a, a crepe batter, except it has liquefied chicken livers and onions mixed into it. And you literally make crepes infused, infused with chicken liver. And then you layer in between each crepe, you have dill, garlic, uh, and farmer cheese or dill, garlic, and mayo, right? The trifectas of, of Ukrainian cooking. And you just stack it all in a round pie. And if you're Oksana, your pie is perfectly round. And if you're Boris, it looks like an unwieldy mushroom, but it's heaven. I mean, you have to like chicken liver, but it's heaven. Um, um, and it was through this project um, that I uh, became interested in um, um, basically learning how to cook. Until then, I was like a, a semi-decent at best home cook, but learning how to make this stuff alongside Oksana, which wasn't, which wasn't without its own um, humor and misadventure, um, I sort of got the idea that I could also inquire after my grandmother's dishes, which felt at this point lost to history because she, you know, she never taught anyone, it was her domain. Um, which is partly how I ended up recreating some things that she made. And all of this started with me going to my parents and being like, you know, can you remind me what grandma, what grandma made? And, and they would say things of which I had no recollection, which also sounded crazy. Like your grandmother made stuffed cabbage. Um, she braised it in um, sourdough rye bread and sour cherry jam. And I was like, what? I mean, that... Uh, made no sense to me. But as I learned more about how food works, it sort of became apparent. You tear up a bunch of sourdough rye. There's this iconic um, uh, bread called Baradinsky um, in, in Russian cooking. Um, and you scoop out 13, you know, 13 ounce jar of sour cherry jam. And on a low fire, all of that turns to the most amazing um, liquid. Um, in which the stuffed cabbage slowly braises. And, and it was her way of approximating, I think, what we would try to create here in America through uh, tomato paste and brown sugar, but she didn't have those things. Um, and so she used what she did. Um, and um, basically to conclude the story, um, for me, for me, though this is a book ostensibly about food and sort of food is the gateway, um, because it's so universal for a lot of people. For me, ultimately, um, it's not about food. For me, ultimately, it is the story of these two extremely, you know, ordinary women, women who were completely extraordinary in the case of my life. And um, I just, you know, I remember having this one conversation with Oksana. I'd come visit my grandfather as he got older, sort of he would eventually... Um, he'd sit with us, but then he'd need to go lie down. And it was just me and her talking. And I remember I said to her once, because she, she was as money obsessed um, as, as, any, as any immigrant person in our community. And I said to her, Oksana, um, if you had all the money in the world, all the money in the world, your, your kids were taken care of, they had jobs, they had families, jo apartments, everything, what would you do? And she, she answered right away, which I was surprised by. And the answer surprised me too. She said, I would open up a cafe. Um, this was the least entrepreneurial person in the world. Or rather, she was entrepreneurial on the wrong side of the law with my grandfather. But sort of the base employment had to be traditional and secure. 
benefits, salary, no risk taking. Um, and she followed that up by saying, you know, I just love feeding people, right? And this is a woman who would never, ever give herself a compliment. And she said, you know, somebody shows up unannounced. I can, I can have a table covered for 12 people within a half hour. And it was no lie. And it's what I find so amazing about cooks like her, which to me is like a million times sexier than any celebrity chef, what any celebrity chef can do. Um, and they made these amazing meals out of nothing, right? It's always dill, onion, garlic, farmer cheese, um, <clears throat> potatoes. Um, and then she said, but you know, I just have to be honest, like, I don't know that that's ever going to happen. All I really, really want was to leave some kind of mark. And I don't think I ever will. Those were her words. Um, and so in, in my own small way, this is me. I don't know how many people this book has reached or will reach, but this is in my own small way, um, me leaving a mark on her behalf or trying to at least relate to the world, the kind of mark she left on me. Um, and ditto for my grandmother to people of whom I think there may be many, 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 many examples walking out there. Uh, I'd venture to say that quite a few families might have women like these in them. Uh, but for some reason, I don't know that they find their way to the page uh, sufficiently often. And I just wanted to do my part to commemorate two women who for me were indeed extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Boris, that was wonderful. Um, are there any questions? I see nobody's put anything into chat, but is there somebody who'd like to unmute themselves and to um, ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, this is Nancy. Hi. Um, nice to meet you, Boris. Um, it, it took me a while to get through your book. Um, and the reason is because what, the question I have for you is, um, I, I felt like in your heart, you had trouble um, feeling your identity, comfortable with your identity. Um, and when you came to America, you, uh, I felt like the part of the book that you were the most comfortable was when you went back to Oksana's place in Europe and um, were there in her environment. And uh, I, I felt like you felt comfortable there. It's, it's an interesting observation because, um, you know, it's interesting if you felt it come across on the page because I do have to say, well, what we have here is, is the dividedness of the immigrant at its heart. And what we mean by this is, <clears throat> um, even though I came to America when I was nine, um, there are huge aspects of this country, uh, its culture, its politics, its economy, its morality, um, that will never feel like home to me. Um, and so, and I think it's different for people who are born here, even if they disagree with many things about the way this country works, the fact that they came up from the root um, makes it less foreign. Whereas for me, it is a kind of foreign grafting. Um, and so, as Nancy says, when I went back to Ukraine, uh, which isn't where I'm from, but it was sufficiently like the Soviet Union I'd left, right? Going back to Russia right now is nothing like going back to the Soviet Union. It's a completely different country. It's kept evolving. Ukraine has evolved less. And in certain non-urban parts of it, you could experience what life was like 30 years ago. Um, and I can't tell you how comforting it was to find some of that stuff that I'd last felt when I was eight and five and three. And part of the reason it felt great was because that was the last time I'd been one of those people who had come up from the root. Um, but it's a limited joy because I can't move back to Ukraine. I'm too much of an American to do so. And, 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 and if I actually tried to make a life there with its endemic corruption and lack of opportunity and suspicion toward Jews, you know, um, I shouldn't say suspicion, things are a bit different now, but there's a kind of othering of Jews that takes place because they're other, uh, they're such an extreme minority. Um, 
and so th this is the conundrum. Um, this is the conundrum of, of the culturally divided person who had the misfortune to be born elsewhere. If you're the kind of person who is sensitive enough to notice um, belonging and the abs absence of it, um, this is the curse, the curse of dividedness. Um, well, you could, you could, you could, uh, I could feel it in your writing. Yeah, that's, that's very sensitive of you. Um, I have a question here from Kate and Kate says, do you have a favorite recipe in the book? Yes. Uh, the two that I mentioned are my favorite because they're, uh, the strangest, um, um, but actually also this book was a kind of mission to rehabilitate Soviet food for people. I think people assume it's gloppy, it's heavy, um, but not at all. Um, you know, there's a recipe for pickled watermelon, which is the most refreshing thing to drink in the summer. It even has like a kind of a Southern uh, American feel to it. I also love something called bonish. Bonish is a Ukrainian word for essentially polenta, but it's a particular kind of polenta um, uh, Ukrainians braise solids, not in water, not in stock, but in dairy very often. Um, and so you plop uh, two cups of sour cream, a cup of milk, and you bring it to a boil and you dump almost a cup of, of finely ground cornmeal into it. And very slowly, very slowly, I shouldn't say dump, you have to like titrate the cornmeal into it and you just stir and stir and stir the way you do with polenta. And then crumbled feta and then mushrooms. And it comes together in about 15 minutes. Um, so it's, it's a weeknight staple, it's vegetarian, it's cheap, and it's so delicious because of that tang and the sour cream. I love that one too. There's, there's um, marinated peppers in there that are made, uh, they're marinated in uh, buckwheat, uh, buckwheat honey and garlic and lemon. Uh, another example of something that's very light, um, I think, and surprising about food from that part of the world. So those are among my favorites for, for different reasons. Uh, I have a question from Diane. Why didn't your grandmother's sister come to America? So she did, they did eventually. Um, it just took them, um, it took them an extra six months to get permission to get out, right? Because it was, you, know, you couldn't leave with your extended family. You left when they allowed you to leave. Um, but this is something I'll never understand. They ended up settling in Detroit. Um, and all these, you know, all these people in Minsk, right? The one upside of life in the Soviet Union was that there was so there was sufficiently little uh, going on um, in terms of entertainment, in terms of opportunity, that people saw each other all the time. And the city was small and not a lot of people had cars. There wasn't traffic. And so people were at, at each other's homes, just eating and drinking and talking on Tuesday, on Thursday, like on, on a weekday. Um, and for some reason, all of us, all our immediate friends, extended friends, uh, immediate family, extended family, friends, ended up immigrating to different parts of America, Detroit, Omaha, San Francisco, Chicago, Florida, almost nobody's in the same place. And I, I, I've broken the chain now even more by going to Montana. So um, the fact that my grandmother's sister did end up coming to America, unfortunately ended up being um, somehow in America, it didn't seem as strange to be living in different cities. Um, whereas it was inconceivable in the Soviet Union, it's part of what the immigration experience changes. Any other questions? Do you teach Russian literature at all? Have you taught it? Um, I tend to teach creative writing rather than literature, um, right? And the best, the best way of differentiating the two is like, if you're teaching literature, the task of the class is, well, what does it mean? But if you're teaching writing, the task of the class is, um, how could we write something similar? Um, how is it put together? Um, and so I've definitely taught um, kind of one-off seminars here and there on literature. I actually love taking books apart in the way that you describe, but, but really like 90% of what I do is teaching writing rather than, than literature. I did major uh, to my parents' great dismay in Russian literature uh, when I went to Princeton. Um, I went to Princeton undergrad. Um, very kind comment from Suzanne uh, about the book, also from Kathleen Nazarenko. Kathleen, are you Ukrainian? 
Hi. Um, actually, I'm Kathleen Casey Nazarenko. So, oh, I see. Um, <laughs> Your husband. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, they are they are Russian, but um, the name is I think Ukrainian. So it's it but is. they are Russian. <laughs> the, same, the same way that names that end in O V are Russian, names that end in K O are Ukrainian. Um, yes. So um, but the yeah, you know, the family came from Russia. Right. Also, Ukraine is a kind of, um, it's kind of a cursed country in the sense that the, the Western half of it is Ukrainian, but the Russian, the, the Eastern half of it is Russian. So it's a very divided place. Um, but it's a very, it's, it's like the ultimate underperformer because it's enormous. <laughs> it has 50 million people. Um, it has incredible resources. It has some of the most fertile soil in the world. There's this saying, which is that if you plant a stick in Ukrainian soil, you're going to have 10 sticks the next day, mm. um, <laughs> which is obviously illogical, but it's, it's sort of a cute way of, of talking about how fertile it is there. So, um, you know, Ukraine is, is waiting for its moment because it's, it's, it's got an incredible amount of promise and potential that it just hasn't. Um, very, very hardworking, resourceful people uh, who've just been very ill served by the people they tend to elect to office who are invariably either unskilled or corrupt or what have you. And of course it doesn't help to have Russia next door with its, with its meddling. Any, any other thoughts, questions? It was also, the Ukraine was also a place that everybody wanted to conquer because of its, um, its location and as a gateway to the Black Sea and to the oil fields, and also because of the fertility of its soil. It was a breadbasket for, for much of Russia. Yeah, Russians have always looked down on the Ukrainians as kind of, by comparison, uneducated hicks, except that it was Ukraine that fed the Soviet Union. And I actually have a section in the book um, about sort of what travelers throughout history have found in these two places and almost to the last they have far kinder words for the people of ukraine than they do for the people of russia and as much as impressive as it is to go to moscow and st petersburg i enjoy myself far more in ukraine um <clears throat> there's a question from kate do you tell your story growing up in russia friends schools um do you mean do i tell my story about growing up in russia here in america um or do I tell it in Russia? Well, I can, I can answer both. Um, <clears throat> I do tell the story a lot and I, you know, it, it, it tends to come up um, as a byproduct of my sort of conversations about my books. Um, and it tends to happen, you know, when I'm in Russia, they're more curious to hear about America because the way that I grew up there is very familiar to them because they grew up the same way. It's a very homogenizing place. Everybody grew up in the same way. And as long as you're older than 30, you know what it was like to grow up in the Soviet Union. Um, whereas in America, it, it, it remains a subject of great interest because you know I think Russia plays a very unusual role in the American imagination. Um, you know, it was the cold, it was the, you know, the enemy for 50 years during the Cold War and even though the Cold War is over, arguably, it's something even worse now. Like, it's an, it's an even more toxic and threatening presence uh, because of the things that it gets up to. And so I think um, a lot of people are looking for explanations and insight. Um, I don't, I, I don't um, give, uh, I occasionally give talks in schools, but the vast majority of my talks are to more adult audiences, but it's a subject of of great interest to them. When I've spoken at schools, it hasn't been a subject of interest there as much. Um, they're thinking about different things. Um, um, I will, you know, Kate just clarified that she was talking about Russia. I will share that in 2016, the US State Department sent me to the Baltics, to Latvia and Estonia, because they both border Russia and they have these sizable um, ethnically Russian populations. And the great concern in these places is that Putin is going to do there what he did in Ukraine, which is use the presence of supposedly unhappy Russian minorities in the border regions as an excuse to invade. 
And so they're very motivated in countering Russian disinformation and keeping these minorities very happy. And so I was sent on a kind of uh, cultural ambassadorship to these places to talk about my life um, as a, you know, a former, a former Russian person in America. It was very eye-opening uh, to have those conversations with them and to, to, to sort of to learn what they were curious about, both about where I came from and my life in America. Um, do your parents consider themselves American? Absolutely not. They neither consider themselves American nor will they ever be American and it's hard to fault them for it. Um, you know, for multiple reasons. One is, um, I just cannot describe to you how different that place was from the one in which we live now. And, um, <clears throat> you know, they weren't 10, they weren't 60, but they weren't 10 when they came, they were 30. Um, but it wasn't only because of that. They're, they're sort of open-minded, curious people. They're not my grandfather. They've explored and they, they, they've, they've um, traveled enormously. They've, they've sort of acquainted themselves with many aspects of American life. But it just, it just remains very difficult to understand why Americans are as concerned as they are with the things that they're concerned about and why they think it's the right way to be in the way that many of them think certain ways are the right way to be. Um, and I have to tell you that I, that my family thought we were immigrating to a slightly different version of America when we did so in 1988. Um, and I have to say that I think, you know, my wife is a Canadian citizen and she and I have actually talked about relocating there. Um, because I'm not, it's not very different for me as it is for my parents. I can sort of work with it better because I'm just more fluent in the culture. I'm more fluent in the language. Um, but for them, it's, it's sort of a, a larger leap. Um, who is the woman pictured in your book? Nancy asks. So um, there is, so if you want to see um, some really, really beautiful photos from both Brooklyn, the Brooklyn kitchen and the Ukraine kitchen, um, there's phenomenally talented young Russian photographer um, whom I had come along uh, and take some very, very beautiful professional photos. Um, and so that is on my Instagram, which is Boris Fishman Books. Um, but I did uh, force the publisher to put one photograph in the book, which is this one. Um, and this is Oksana. And that's me in the background. Um, and I'm laughing so hard from something she said that I need to I'm crying and I'm wiping it away with a napkin. Um, so yeah, we, we, we got up to some, um, some good times. I really, I really just love the fact that this random woman from an older generation in Ukraine could become so close with my grandfather, who was a generation older, with me, who was a generation younger. Um, um, I also think, I think Oksana is very beautiful as well. And this is why it breaks my heart that She's never found a life partner who deserves her because she is such a cool lady. And she comes from a place where a lot of people, it's not that they're not cool, but they're very limited. They're very limited because of the circumstances in which they grew up. They're suspicious of outsiders. They're, they're, they're a bit prejudiced. They're not particularly, um, you know, modest, though they should be. <laughs> um, um, and she's just, she's just an incredibly subtle, refined interesting person uh, and I really admire her for it um, and so it's sad for me that she has spent most of her life in, in sort of romantic solitude. Any other questions? Mr. Fishman, <laughs> Lorraine Lavergine. I enjoyed very much listening to you this evening, but I just wondered, what did you mean when you said, when you had arrived in the, I think it was mid or late 80s, that you were slightly disillusioned about what you did find in America? What had you anticipated finding when you we thought, arrived? We thought there, were, there would be gold on trees. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, these are some of the, the sort of the fantasies that I referenced um, early in the talk. 
developing in the absence of accurate information. You know, the people who had gone before us, the passage was so traumatizing. The experience of assimilating and integrating in a new culture was so challenging. When we spoke to them, they were very invested in making it seem like this place was awesome and it was worth all the trouble and it was worth immigrating to and you made boatloads of money and everybody was super nice. And I mean, th there is no country that can bear the weight of a fantasy like that. Um, um, so the expectations were unfair. And it is true um, that you can make more money easily here. And it is true that there is less discrimination than there was there. Um, but there are also lots of other things. Um, I write about all this in the book. Um, it's, it's chapter six, I believe, which is the arrival chapter. Um, that really took us aback. Um, we were taken aback by uh, the way people related to each other or didn't relate to each other. Um, we were sort of surprised by um, certain aspects of the informality in American culture. We were kind of stunned by the ways in which uh, money, um, the, the same things that sent you to prison in the Soviet Union were here called business. Um, and mm -hmm. we, were kind of, we were kind of stunned by what was legal in this country and what kind of behaviors were whitewashed by references to, um, you know, <clears throat> profit and, and the American way. Um, we've been sort of shocked by the way the idea of freedom um, has been exploited by various interest groups in this country to justify things that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, and on and on and on, the list, go, the list is long. Um, uh, we were taken aback by the degree even of, of uh, religiousness in this country. We came from an atheist country. And, and by the way, I should specify, I'm not implying that we were right and Americans were wrong, but it's really shocking to arrive in a country where 76% of the population um, says it believes in God when you've come from a country where, you know, all of us maybe saw through the Soviet experiment, but the atheists think we, we, we bought hook, line, and sinker. That made sense to us. And it does to this day. Um, and so it was just, it was just a, like, it was a cultural clash. And maybe this is actually a, a question for, for Kathleen, who was married, into, uh, married to somebody um, partly from that culture. Um, as, as time goes by, the differences between the cultures seem more so rather than less fast. pronounced to me. You have to limit the number of people you invite. And the people that you do invite, think about how they're going to be seated ahead of time. Uh, people can be seated I'm together in some kind of household, but they should be able to six feet away read. from another. Okay. Um, uh, if you all forgive me for just one second, my wife is at the door with the baby. I'd asked her to be out till 845. So uh, I will be right back in one minute, maybe just another question or two, and, and we'll call it an evening. One second. Does anybody have a last question or two for um, for Bru for Boris? I might have another one. It's Nancy. Nancy, okay. Oh, oh my gosh! How, how beautiful. beautiful! How beautiful! How beautiful! This is God. Agnes. <laughs> Agnes is uh, for all my for all my. Uh, Complaining about the discrepancies between Russian and American culture. Um, and my wife is not Russian nor Jewish, and Agnes is our sweet, sweet daughter. Oh, uh, she is she's, she's absolutely beautiful. I'm now letting That's her go. Beautiful child. Well, I'm, it's funny because I'm Nancy again. I'm um, I'm Presbyterian and I'm from the Midwest, and my husband is a Polish Russian Jew. Oh, wow. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's a little different, but he's uh, really smart and very funny. And uh, so who cares? Um, but a lot of um, your discomfort in your growing up and your, even in your formative years in your 20s and 30s, um, I found uh, almost difficult to read at times. And I know that you were speaking of uh, 
um, the D word. Uh, I don't know how old the baby is, but. <laughs> but oh, the, um, I've got my headphones in, so. Oh, okay, gonna... so the, the, the depression issues and um, how difficult it was to get through all of that. How much of the, the um, being an immigrant or, or even being Jewish do you think um, contributed to that aspect of your struggle? Yes, take. So that's actually a great question. You know, people often ask you, would you write anything differently in the book? And since I finished the book, I've realized that the reasons I cite, um, this is an episode of clinical depression that takes place in the book. And I think the cause that I find for it in the book is romantic. But in retrospect, I don't think it had anything to, to do with that. I think that was the superficial cause. I think that was the costs of immigrating sort of finally claiming their cost and their toll uh, 15 or 20 years later. And the costs I'm referring to is not only the shock of arriving in a new place, it is also, um, I sort of became the adult in the family. I learned English first. I was asked to be the one who took care of all the family's affairs. All these affairs were very foreign because there was all sorts of things in American life that weren't a part of Soviet life. Um, we didn't have credit cards. We didn't have insurance. We didn't have these complicated bills with surcharges. We didn't have all these institutions that existed in America. Lives were much more sheltered, much more constricted, but also much simpler in sometimes a beautiful way. Um, it really left more time for, you know, there were fewer pleasures, but you had more time for them. You know, I, I, I don't know which way is better, but that was definitely true. And so I sort of carried, you know, I, I was the sheltered one before we came to America because, um, you know, my parents knew how to navigate, excuse me for one second, while my sweet Agnes destroys something here. Um, <laughs> my parents, love, can I ask you to grab Agnes before she destroys the rest of my possessions? Um, <clears throat> they, they, they sort of, they knew how to navigate that system. And so they sheltered me. They protected me from just how rough it was to be a Jewish person in the USSR. Um, when we got here, suddenly it felt to me to shelter them. And I just, no, no 10 or 11 year old should be placed in that position, but I, um, I did it. I had to do it because I wanted them to be happier. I wanted them to be safer. I wanted them to feel more secure and whatever I could do because I'd learned the language I would. I just spent, I think the first 10 years of my American life in like non-ending stress and dread and anxiety at getting the wrong answer, figuring out the wrong information, failing in some task that was said before me. And I had no one and nothing to send that confusion and anxiety and anger out toward. And I think I just sort of sent it inside. And once I finally graduated from that life, and I didn't really graduate from it until very recently, you know, eventually there comes a day when you say to your parents, hey guys, you've been here for a long time. You got to take care of the stuff yourself. Um, and it's not like suddenly they say, okay, thank you for your service. We'll take over from here. No, there's a lot of resistance and these arguments go on for years. You don't want to hurt these people. You want it to be a soft landing, right? And when finally, finally, you know, the valve releases and finally you feel slightly less responsible, genuinely in the heart for all these things that you've been made to feel very responsible for, I think that's when something finally gave. Um, and so it was very, very sort of astute of you to pick up that that was about something other than what I thought it was at the time I was writing the book. Well, it was good that at the end of the book, there, there appeared to be a, a, a level of resolve and you did a great job. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> my only hope, my only hope is that um, and I actually wrote, a, wrote an, uh, uh, an op-ed, not an op-ed, I guess an essay in the New York Times about this last year. My only hope is that Agnes's passage, um, I'm, I'm under no illusions about whether she is going to have problems in life or not. Of course she will. My only hope is that her problems are new and fresh and different and are not the same reheated and rewarmed problems that the generations in an ex-Soviet community um, recreate over and over because th that's what happens in those communities, right? Like certain behaviors by my grand, you know, I described, when I described my grandmother, I described to you a person I admire very much. She was also in other departments, a very difficult person um, who often 
again, because of the things she suffered, because of the traumas she had undergone, treated my mom in ways that were very difficult for her. But my mom was toward me in the same exact ways because just it is not a part of that culture. Whether you live there or you live here, it doesn't matter. It is not a part of that culture to stop and put yourself outside the experience and dismantle it and try to understand it and decide what to do differently and better. No, you show love by agreeing and doing the same things. Um, and so the best gift that I can give Agnes is to no longer be that kind of person. That is the ultimate, I think, transcending of what it means to be from that place. Mm -hmm. I will always adore the, 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 the culture, the literature, the food, the humor. I have the greatest respect I've ever had for all those things. I do not want its psychology. Um, well, you brought, the, you brought the beauty of the culture in your book. I'm, I'm grateful to hear it, and I want to, because I don't want to minimize that part. But in this department, America wins. I mean, uh, there are genuine freedoms of the mind and of the body in this culture that, that whatever my alienations from aspects of life here, um, I will never lose sight of, because it's, it's unique in the world. Thank you. It's my yes. great pleasure. I wish I wish I got to see more of you because I just I felt like I was talking to a field of of, of black squares or rectangles. But um, our pictures uh, were blocked out. I don't know why. Every, everybody's everybody was well. Everybody's cameras was off. So um, thank you for your interest. Thank you, Boris. And, and maybe someday in the future we'll get to meet in person. Sounds great. Thank I think you we're very neighbors. much for coming. <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> So everybody join us for our next two um, Zoom programs, one next Tuesday, and then one again in August. And thank you again, Boris, for giving of your time and good luck in your new teaching position. I, I, I hope it goes well.